Right. So we've been making our way through the urinary system. We're looking at it uh, anatomically, looking at the physiology of each of the different urinary organs. From the kidney, where we come back to the the microanatomy of the kidney, where we actually filter and produce the urine. Uh, we discuss the reader. The urinary bladder is where we're going to pick up. The urinary bladder. The urinary bladder is going to be a storage spot, so a storage spot for that urine or a storage depot for the urine that's been produced. Now, once the urine is deposited into the bladder, nothing else really changes. This is going to be excreted as is into the external environment. There are a couple differences here that are gender specific between males and females. One of the questions, one of the great districts guys, why do you go to the bathroom more frequently than you? If you've not noticed this before. So question. Do females really micturate? That term there is the scientific term for urinate. So do females really micturate more often? Than men. And if you think about this question, all of the other organ systems and organs that we talked about are relative to body size. Yes, women may have a smaller set of lungs than men, but when we take it relative to body size, it levels the plane. And relative to body size, organs are typically very close to being, if not identical, when it's taken in that relative perspective. So, do females urinate or micturate more often than men? So do women have smaller bladders? Is this a case where there is no way to level the playing field? And the answer is really yes and no. Women actually do urinate more frequently, but it's not because their bladder is small. It actually is because of some of the other anatomy that surrounds the urinary bladder in females that's not present in males. In particular, the uterus sits on top of the bladder. So even though the bladder is the same size because you have this pear-shaped organ called the uterus, sitting down and compressing the uterus, the total volume is actually reduced. So yes, females do urinate more frequently. However, it's not because the organs are smaller. It's because of this other anatomical explanation. So the next time you're on a date, just give them a break, guys. It's all there right now. Finally, leading away from the urinary bladder, you have this tube that leads to the external environment called the urethra. Uh, we have a little anatomical difference here between males and females. In the female reproductive system, uh, the urethra is not shared with the reproductive system. In the male reproductive system, the urethra is shared with the reproductive system. The urethra is going to be the tube leading away from the bladder to the external environment. Now, fortunately, this tube is not just an open tube. If it was, we have constant embarrassment as we urinate in our pants all the time. But we have a check that has some visceral control. At the bladder end of the urethra, there's a small circular smooth muscle ring called the urethral sphincter. And 
this holds back any flow until hopefully the individual is ready to deposit that someplace. Let's say it right here is such a tree for the woods. So let's go back and take a look at the kidney. And we have a cross section through this particular kidney here. This is not a cross section, that's full organ. Um, inside, what we're going to find in cross section is as we get more and more microscopic, as we zoom in on more and more detail, we're going to find more and more anatomy in the kidneys. So here's just a slightly different look at that kidney, kind of taking that kidney out. We're just looking at uh, a single kidney in cross section. And you can see that we have all kinds of structures here. We're going to take it even a step further, zoom in even more, look at individual renal pyramids and uh, in the individual portions of the renal cortex and the renal medulla and see what kind of things are at that microscopic level. Um, so before we do that, we'll just kind of take our way through this image here that highlights some of the major features that you should be aware of. At the onset, the kidney has two layers of tissue. So there are two layers of tissue, and this is very common in a lot of different organs that we've already looked at. We have an outer layer, which you can see here, and then we have an inner layer that contains those pyramids. The outer layer and this is not just true to the kidneys, but again, to a lot of different organs. Outer layer of an organ is frequently referred to as the cortex. So the outer layer of the kidney is the cortex. The inner layer is the medulla. I know it looks like it should be pronounced the medulla. And I've heard it pronounced that way, but really the most appropriate pronunciation is the medulla. So the cortex and the medulla. You will notice that there are also two very prominent vessels that are leading into the kidneys. Those two prominent vessels are going to be the renal artery, shown there in red. And the renal artery is responsible for bringing oxygenated, nutrient-rich blood to the kidney. The other vessel is the renal vein. And the renal vein is responsible to bring blood back from the kidney after it's circulated through all large portion of the microanatomical features that are present inside of the kidney. You have two from the kidney. And if you look at it, you have off of the heart, the, the main vessel coming out of the heart is called the aorta. And it makes this arch and it comes down pretty close to straight down to the center of the body. The renal artery is going to come off of that uh, that descending aorta. So it's a pretty actually high pressure vessel because it's not that far away from the heart. And then the veins come back in and you have a large vessel that comes up from the lower extremities and on its way through the abdomen to the bottom of the right atria, that's called the inferior vena cava, those renal vessels, uh, renal veins come in and attach to the vena cava. So we're not too far away from the heart on either side of the circulation, kidney circulation. So you have the inner and the outer layers, the renal cortex, the renal medulla. Inside of the medulla, we have a whole bunch of different features in there. Um, the, the renal pyramids and columns in between the pyramids. Uh, and then as we extend down here into the, re the reader, we have basically drainage leading into the, the reader that are called the calluses, the major and minor calluses. From the renal pyramids, 
into these drainage portions called the major and minor calluses. This is where urine is going to begin to drain into the urethra down to the urethra as well. Connected up to those drainage ports, if you will, is a bunch of microanatomical features. And that's what I want to talk to you about now. And this is really where the physiology of the kidney comes alive. There are millions of these structures, and they're tube like structures. And primarily, but not exclusively, we find these structures inside of the medulla. So you have millions of tube like structures in the medulla. And for now, what I'd like you to think about is this is where the urine is going to be initially captured and modified. And then as we leave those tube like structures that are located in places like these renal pyramids, we're going to move through these other portions of the kidney that are basically just drainage. So those millions of tube like structures in the medulla, they lead away to this thing called the renal pelvis, which is this region right in here. It's basically the very beginning of that ureter. It's, a, it's kind of like a funnel leading into the ureter that's going to deposit the urine down to, um, down to the urinary bladder. So from the medulla, we begin to extract urine and modify urine. And then it's collected through these things called the minor, here are the minor calluses to the major calluses, and the major, there's two of them shown on here, into the renal pelvis. So the urine gets excreted from those renal pyramids through the calluses into the renal pelvis, which acts primarily as an open cavity, very similar to a funnel that you may use to deposit oil into your engine. This open cavity acts as the initial site for urine fluid deposit. And does lead from the renal pelvis conversion to the ureter. And the rest of the story there for the year is to go to the urinary bladder for a little short, short amount of storage. And then once we've had accumulation of excessive urine, you get the urge to go and you go to express urine through the urethra. Now, those tube-like structures, and literally there are millions of them that are situated primarily here in the medulla. Some extend out into the cortex a little bit. I'm going to show you more picture here in just a second, but remember that they were the starting point for urine formation. Now, where am I actually extracting that urine from? Where do I initially pull the fluid that will eventually become urine? What are we trying to maintain? What's the fluid we're trying to maintain with the urinary system? The blood. So those millions of tubes need to be interfaced to the blood. So the tubes are surrounded by capillaries, and these capillaries act as an interface for exchange from the blood to the ear. So yes, what I am saying right now is this structure here. So this is our renal pyramid. Here you can see leading from the renal pyramid into a callusy down to the uh, renal pelvis into the ureter. 
we are interacting very closely with the blood. We are extracting a portion of the blood to generate urine. So your urine is really a modified blood product. So what are we going to call these tube-like structures that make up the microanatomy of the kidney? And by the way, there are you're being shown two of those tube-like structures. If this was drawn to scale and in reality, there would be hundreds of those tube-like structures in individual, even thousands in individual renal here. We are going to call these nephrons. So this structure here, which is blown up from here, is called a nephron. The nephron is defined anatomically, biologically, physiologically as the functional unit of urine production. Urine production. So these are going to function to produce urine. And in the process of producing urine, think of urine production as extracting water in order to extract and exchange other metabolites. Many of them will be waste products. And some of these things that are waste products are things that aren't necessarily things that we would think of as being waste, but they are waste in terms of the excessive accumulation of those products in the bloodstream. Things like your ions can become waste if they are excessive in the bloodstream. If you have too much sodium, we're going to pull water into the kidney. Along with that water, you pull in some sodium, and that sodium is what gets deposited into the urine alongside the water to generate to generate your urine. Now, each of these individual systems here, again, about a million in each of your kidneys, overall two million in the human body, they're going to be responsible to pick up roughly 180 liters of water per day. So in a 24-hour period, we will filter 180 liters of water. Now, what do we know about that 180 liters of water? Is all of it going to be expressed as urine? No. You'll remember that roughly, we're normally right around 1,000 milliliters to 2,000 milliliters of urine production. So we're at a really, really small fraction. 180 to 90 to 180 times as much filtration is going to occur than urine is actually produced. So we actually, if you're kind of thinking ahead, we're going to have to have mechanisms in place to take most, most of that 180 liters of water back into the bloodstream. So normal urine production is between 500 milliliters to 24 liters. 24 liters, if you're consuming large quantities, and normally that doesn't last but maybe an hour or two. So you might produce one to two liters in an hour, or as low as 500 milliliters is what we we'll call it. So we're still talking about a very small fraction of 180, even at very high urinary production rates. So most of that fluid that's passed into the kidney and into that microanatomy is going to be recovered and returned to the bloodstream. So if we take a look at the anatomy here, the anatomy is going to be the key to understand how we can generate 180, or how we, how we can filter 180 liters of water in a 24-hour period for turning the vast majority of that back into the bloodstream. Now, just to make sure that I'm clear on this, 
I'm not saying that you have 180 liters of blood. You really only have about five liters of blood. You're going to circulate that five liters of blood dozen to, you know, I mean, over 20, 30 times, dozens of times in a 24 hour period and get the 180 liters. So you're constantly cycling that five liters of blood through the kidneys, helping to maintain the chemistry and the water makeup and the waste removal capabilities. All right, so if you look at the anatomy here, this portion of the nephron, this whole thing, this whole structure, leading up to this point right here and all that through here, all of this is called the nephron. This part here is the collecting duct, which is not part of the nephron specifically, but interacts with a variety of different uh, nephrons inside of the kidney. The part here that interacts with the blood, this is a capillary bed. The part that interacts with the capillaries here is called the glomerular capsule. You have a layer of cells here that surround these capillaries. And inside here, this is, is taken in cross-section. It's actually open. So I basically kind of think about a tennis ball, except for instead of having the rubber wall of the tennis ball, that rubber wall, you have two different sides. And in between those two sides, it's open, and then it's open on the very inside. On the very inside, there's a capillary. So the capillary comes in, circulates blood through that glomerular capsule that's encasing that capillary. And a layer of cells on the inside, a layer of cells on the outside. The outer layer of cells leads and forms this tube-like structure. So all of this is an open tube we'd be able to identify a lumen inside of this open tube. Blood is extracted, the water component of blood is extracted through this first layer of capillaries and begins to build up inside of this glomerular space in the whole structure called the glomerular capsule. So this glomerular capsule is a cup or a ball of tissue made up of individual cells that allow interaction with a capillary bed. So collectively, the whole thing is actually referred to as the renal corpuscle. That's the blood supply and then the kidney uh, anatomy there as well. Individually, the part of the nephron that's in the renal corpuscle is going to be called the glomerular capsule. The capillary supply is called the glomerulus. So our capillaries come in, wind all through in here, and then they come back out. And so this is each each of these kind of portions here is just a layer of cells, so I could draw in the individual cells to kind of give you a better idea what this looks like. And what's going to happen here is as the blood circulates through, some of the water is pulled into this space. And this is going to lead into the rest of the nephron here. So that glomerulus, the blood supply, deposits some of, of the fluid into this glomerular space. So this begins to fill up with kind of that initial or that primordial urine that's going to be modified a few times until it's deposited into the, uh, the collecting duct on the way into the renal pelvis down to the urethra. So the urine is filtered into the cup. So we have this initial site of urine formation. Now, 
that cup begins to fill up with urine. Eventually, the urine is going to need to go someplace as we fill up that cup more and more. The urine, through increases in pressure as more fluid is brought into the glomerular space, pushes its way out into the rest of the nephron, which is primarily a tubular system. <coughs> So the tube leads away from the capsule. So this first initial urine that's formed, we're going to call that the filtrate. Because it's really basically filtering from the blood through the glomerular membrane into the glomerular space of the glomerular capsule. That filtrate begins to permeate through the rest of this tube-like structure. The initial part of that tube-like structure, you can see here that it's sort of twisted and curved. Another term for that is convoluted. It's also very close, in close proximity to the glomerular capsule. And so I'm going to call this the proximal convoluted tubule, or most biologists just simply call it the PCT. So it's the proximal convoluted tubule because it's close and nearby and it's twisted and convoluted. Sorry. So that filtrate begins to circulate through this proximal convoluted tubule and then it moves into this kind of hairpin like loop or this hairpin like structure. This is a, a named after the guy who first discovered it. His name was Henley, H-N-L-E. So frequently it's referred to as the loop. Well, the loop of Henley. That would be called an epithem, meaning that it's still using the guy's name who discovered it. We try to move away from the use of epithems just because it doesn't uh, really provide a great description of what that is actually called. Um, a better description here is to call it the loop of Henley. Not just the loop of Henley. A better description here than loop of Henley is to call it the nephron loop. Now, as you're observing the loop of Henley or the nephron loop, you'll see that there are two different portions. There's a portion that descends, and we're going to call that the descending limb, and then there's a portion that ascends, and we'll call that the ascending limb. So the descending limb of the nephron loop is the loop of heaven and the ascending limb. Now, from there, this filtrated urine, as it travels through the proximal convoluted tubule through the descending and ascending limbs, they're going to move into a second curved or twisted or convoluted part of the tubular system. This is a lot further away. It's at a greater distance, so we're going to call it the distal convoluted tubule. distal convoluted tube. At the very end here, the nephron is going to empty into a uh, tubular structure called the collecting duct. Now note, the collecting duct is not officially part of the nephron. It's the collecting duct. It's the spot where the nephron is going to deposit the urine that has just been formed and modified and it's now ready for excretion. So we put it into the collecting duct. In all reality, we actually still have some ability to modify the urine through the collecting duct, but by the time we move from the collecting duct into the renal pyramid, I'm sorry, renal pelvis, sorry, renal pelvis, to the ureter, the urine is going to primarily be in its body form. 
So that collecting duct will connect to the renal pelvis. And then to the renal. Real briefly, I want to talk about that blood supply. We have individual capillary beds that interact with each of our individual million to two million nephron that we find inside of each of our kidneys. We're going to have blood that gets brought in, circulates through, and gets brought back out. Now, this is a little bit of a unique situation because the blood that gets brought back in gets brought back out of the capillary bed actually circulates to a second capillary bed before it circulates into the venous side of circulation. The blood that br that's brought to the nephron comes through a vessel called the afferent arteria. So the blood to the nephron through the afferent arteria. So as that blood gets brought in, it's now going to be deposited into that capillary bed. In the capillary bed, which acts like a network in the capsule, is where we're going to have fluid exchange. So we have a network of capillaries in the capsule. Where we have blood and solutes filtered into the capsular space. Then, on the other side of that network of capillaries, the blood begins to flow back out. And it leaves through an efferent arteria. So this is going to be blood away. Now, I'm overemphasizing afferent and efferent. Because really, in uh, proper pronunciation, they're afferents and afferents, which sound very, very similar. Afferent is taking blood to the capillary bed. Efferent, blood exits the capillary bed. Now, the blood that passes to the afferent arterial, the efferent arterial, is going to be filtered blood. So this is greatly modified blood. And in fact, it's modified so much that we don't want to deposit it back into the general circulation just yet. We've lost a lot of our critical ions and other materials, other metabolites. Some of those have to be recovered. So from the efferent arterial, we're going to take that filtered blood and we're going to lead to a second capillary network. So we lead to a second capillary network. So here's a slightly different appearance or way of looking at <coughs> this, uh, this nephron in its circulation. Here's our afferent bringing blood in. We have the glomerulus, which is the capillary circulation in 
we call a variant or a capsule. And then we have our ferret E ferret leading away. And we go here to a second capillary bed, or we can be diverted to a second capillary bed that surrounds the, the uh, proximal and distal convoluted tubules. So they surround that those parts of the tubular system. So we're going to call those the paratubular capillaries. And this is going to allow a second point of interaction between the nephron and the circulation the, uh, of blood that's just been filtered through the glomerulus. You will also notice that some of the blood is brought back to interact here with a third capillary bed. This is called the vasa recta. It's a capillary bed that surrounds the nephron loop and then leads back towards the real vein. Okay, so you have the glomerulus, the paratubular capillaries, and vasa recta, all interacting with that filtrated blood to filter the blood or modify the blood before we send it back towards the renal vein, which eventually will make it back into the general circulation. So let me rewrite paratubular capillaries here. That's the last thing you should have had in your notes there before I cleared the screen. So those paratubular capillaries, let's add in vasorecta as well. Um, that's going to be around the loop of heavy. These second two capillary beds Around the proximal and distal, the proximal and distal convoluted tubules, which I'm going to bring in as CT, and then vasorector around the nephron loop. Okay. Both of these locations are receiving modified blood. It's filtered here. And so as it comes through, this blood is very modified from what we find in other parts of the circulation. And these two capillary beds are going to allow additional filtration of water, ions, and waste products. And this will be the anatomical answer to how do we filter 180 liters but really only generate a thousand milliliters of urine. What we're going to find is large quantities of water inside you will be driven back into the blood as they pass through these circulatory circuits. And in fact, the kidney is designed to allow optimal operation of these capillary beds to achieve that end result of recovering massive quantities of water and uh, ions in particular while maintaining waste disposal. Okay. So let's take a look at the actual process of your information. Uh, what you're seeing here is sort of a expanded view of the nephron. Um, so it's a non-anatomical view. It's going to be better to, to look at it in this direction so that we can look at each of the individual parts of the nephron here. And what you're seeing is as we go through the nephron, and even some here in the collecting duct, there is going to be certain locations where we have water that's going to be extracted or water that's going to be added back in or potassium 
um, hydrogen that are removed or hydrogen that's put back in. So there's all different sorts of places where we're going to see water be deposited into the tissue of the kidney or be deposited into the filtering inside of the gut. So as we're going through this, we're thinking about the tissue of the kidney and the filtrate or the forming urine inside of the nephron. Those are your two different locations. <coughs> so for your information, we have three different functions that we're going to rely on. And these three different functions can be increased and decreased in their amount of operation that will lead towards the ability to generate various urinate, uh, various urine concentrations. So real quick, if I'm dehydrated, do I want to generate a really dilute, which means heavy water containing urine? No, if I'm dehydrated, I want to conserve water. I want to make sure I bring water back in. What if I am overly hydrated? Has the effect of increase, increase the blood pressure, um, can result in pushing fluid into the tissue, causing a condition known as edema. If I have high amounts of water in the bloodstream, do I want to produce concentrated, low water containing urine, or dilute urine, which we keep in large amounts of water? They don't want to contain or produce the loop here. So we're going to use these three different functions to go from producing extremely dilute to extremely concentrated urine. When I say dilute, think lots of water. When I say concentrated, think no water. All right, so those three functions, I'm going to label them here, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about each of them individually. The first is glomerular filtration, which you probably have already been able to guess is going to occur where. How about the glomerulus? So we're going to use glomerular filtration to initially filter the blood. And then we're going to use tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion to modify that filter. So the glomerulus is where we have glomerular filtration. And as we move, and this is my capillaries, by the way, so these are the paratubular capillaries. We would also have a link that would go down here that would deal with the, uh, the uh, loop of hemia, the nephron loop there. And so glomerular filtration, generating that initial filtrate. That filtrate pushes into the proximal convoluted tubule. And you can see we use this thing called tubular reabsorption. We're actually going to be depositing things back into the circulation or back into the tissue of the kidney. So reabsorption means reabsorption to the body, not reabsorption to the urine. So we're pulling it out of the urine back to the body. There's going to be a lot of stuff here in green with water movement, and we'll take care of that water movement as we deal with each of these different uh, um, functions as, uh, as, we, as we progress with it. And then tubular secretion. Secretion, I know it sounds a little bit strange because tubular secretion, you think, okay, it's sort of secreting something out of the tubule. No, actually, the tubular secretion is secretion from the body back into the tube itself. Okay? So reabsorption to the body, secretion from the body to the tubule. All 
Okay, just about out of time here. Um, let me just start to kind of introduce you to glomerular filtration. So with glomerular filtration, you have interaction between the blood and the glomerulus. That's the capillaries that you find in the glomerular capsule. And then the glomerular capsule itself. And think about this as being extracting water and other material from the blood into the glomerular space. That very much sounds like you're filtering something. You kind of think of the glomerular, the cells of the glomerular capsule as kind of being a membrane, we have a barrier, and we're pulling from fluid from one side through that barrier, through that filter, into the glomerular space. So this results in filtration of a form of plasma minus the protein. The proteins are too big. So we leave the protein behind, we pull the water, and a lot of the other dissolved stuff that's in that water inside of the blood. The watery component takes back to circulation. What was the watery component of the blood called? Anyone remember? Plasma. So we're now going to filter out of that blood a protein free form of that plasma. And this is going to be the initial formation of urine. So just to try to solidify this real quick, what color was plasma? Can you remember? It wasn't white. We had a white layer in there. We called that the buffy white coat. It was the top layer. Remember, we spun down a container of, of blood, and we had the three different layers before. One of them was white. One of them was was red and the other was it was yellow. And what color is your urine? Most of the time it's yellow. Hopefully. So you actually are taking that yellow plasma and that's basically what you're extracting minus any of the contained proteins. And from there you're going to take that yellow substance and through uh, the tubular secretion, tubular reabsorption, we're going to be modifying that. We'll pick up there on Wednesday.